You're listening to Recovery Survey, the podcast that shatters stigmas around different types of addictions and takes a deep dive into spiritual principles. I don't think the world considers obsessive compulsive food disorder, bulimia, anorexia, sugar addiction. I don't think the world responds to them as a form of addiction. My guest today is named Robin Clare. She is a spiritual author as well as a recovery and writing coach. She's here today to talk to us about her book, Feast and Famine, and her battle with bulimia. Welcome to the show. So thank you, Brett, for inviting me to your podcast. My name is Robin Clare, and I am a spiritual author, and I have written three books that are published and one that's on the way and then one that's knocking at the door to be written. And so today, um, thank you for inviting me on to talk about my third book, Feast and Famine, Healing Addiction with Grace. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah. Yes. So um, this book was inspired. um, So I was sharing with Brett before the call that I'm a spiritual channel. I uh, write books for the non-physical realm at various different levels of the spiritual realm. I also teach others how to write from the spiritual realm and coach them on uh, writing for their recovery. And so this book was requested for me to write by Sophia. Sophia is known um, as grace. Anytime we receive any kind of grace in our lives, it comes from Sophia, and she is in Christianity known as the Holy Spirit, and in Judaism, she's known as the Shekhinah, and she she's represents the feminine energy of God, and so she arrived in a meditation for me in a beautiful waterfall. I was in this meditation, and uh, she arrived and asked me, she even actually gave me the title of the book which is very helpful. (laughs) So the name of the book is Feast and Famine, Healing Addiction with Grace. And so the book is about the spiritual realm's perspective on our addiction problem in the world. And it's also about my 40-year journey with obsessive compulsive food disorder and bulimia. That's what the book is about. Well, if you don't mind telling us a little bit about that journey, I don't want you to give away too much mm-hmm. that w- that's in the book, but I'd love to hear some of that journey because I think you're the first person I've had on that struggled with uh, with the food addiction side of things. Yes. And what's interesting, I that happens to me a lot, Brett, that I'm the first person that people have had, had on because I don't think the world considers obsessive compulsive food disorder, bulimia, anorexia, sugar addiction. I don't think the world re- responds to them as a form of addiction. They're usually considered a disorder. People typically do not think they're addicted to food, but you can easily become addicted to food as any other substance. So what I'd love to do is step back to the book a moment, because what the spiritual realm has shared with me is that there's actually only one true addiction on the planet, and that is to suffering. And then we pick our vice, our substance, our habit, our bad relationship, our job that we can't leave, whatever it is. So it's so much more. There's so much more to addiction than just the, you know, the big ones that we know, alcoholism, drugs, you know, smoking, porn. We could be addicted to social media and Netflix or listening to podcasts, right? We could be addicted to anything. And so what happens is, is that we come in here, right? At, you know, we're a little perfect, beautiful baby and we're, and we're all about self-love, right? Babies are just adorable and everybody loves them except maybe when they're colicky, but we all love them. And then we start getting influenced by our parents' traumas, right? Their own personal traumas, our siblings, our teachers, our friends, the media is all about 
making us not feel good about ourselves. And so we start developing these trauma patterns in our system, in our mind, in our spirit, in our emotions, in our physical body. And if we don't heal those traumas, then we start to um, go into what's called self-loathing. So we move move out of self-love into self-loathing. And if we don't know that we're in self-loathing and we can't, we don't get the help we need, which most people don't, because who gets help as a kid, right? Or a teenager, we really don't. It's supposed to like sort of goes with the territory that a teenager is self-loathing, right? But it can then turn into suffering, you know, really deep suffering. And then if we don't address the suffering, then we start looking for other ways to feel better. And that becomes the substances that we use or social media or looking for likes on Facebook, right? Those are intended to help us to stop wallowing in our pain which is really the definition of suffering is wallowing, right, in your pain. So Feast and Famine, the book, is about a spiritual system to help you move through your suffering to what I call surrender. And surrender is when you, I guess, as as they say in Alcoholics Anonymous, let go, let God. When you really let go of you're like, you are done, done, done. Like, there's no question. It's not like, oh, I wish I didn't do this anymore. That's not surrender. Surrender is I will never take another pill again, or I will never throw up again. That was my thing was the bulimia. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, as so after you surrender, what arrives for you is grace. And grace is available to us 24-7, and it comes from so many sources. It's like the spiritual realm arranges for us to have grace. Maybe someone's listening to this podcast, right? That's grace, right? Maybe a friend says, hey, I have this therapist you should try, or would you like to come to me with me to a meeting, right? I I know you're serious this time about recovery. All of these things are grace. And it's around us, and we just have to be open to receive it. And that is actually not as small as it sounds. Grace must be allowed is one of the tenets of this book, because you'd think people would allow grace in their lives, Brett, but sometimes they don't because they're so used to the role that they play in their fam- with their family and friends. Oh, yeah, I'm the addict. I'm the loser. You know, Nothing, my life is never going to be better, but it's so not true. Grace is available to every single being on this planet, and you just have to be willing to allow it in so that you can actually heal. And then ultimately, what it was required is for you to, once you're, once you're clearly not using whatever it is that you used to wallow in your pain, then ultimately you would really need to start healing your life and going for uh, how to heal the trauma, right? How to uncover it and heal it so that you can stay in long-term recovery. And I highly, highly recommend that someone do this trauma work with a professional. There are so many professionals that are trained in this work. And some call it inner child work. Some call it excavating of your parts. It, I don't, it, all, all therapists, uh, life coaches are good for this. Counselors, they, they all do this work. And basically what you're doing is healing the inner child in you, right? And, and letting that inner child know that you're now a grown up <laughs> and that you want to live a healthy and productive life. So that is what Feast and Famine is about. So for me, the interest, some of the interesting things, Brett, is that when I first was given this mission, I was still in addiction. And so I had to fake it till I made it. And I did that. And I got to the end of the first 
version of Feast and Famine. And the ending of my book was, well, I hope these teachings work for you. They didn't work for me. So have a nice life. And I'm like, I can't publish that. And then I hit rock bottom with my bulimia. I was given a message. My grandmother came through. Uh, one of my friends that's a medium came through. See, we all kind of hang out together. <laughs> all of us channels and mediums. And she said, your grandmother said that if you don't bury your bulimia, your family will bury you. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, but like someone who needs that last glass of wine or that last joint or that last lookup of porn, right? I pigged out and then I decided I needed to throw up. And when I did that time, the pain in my body, Brett, was extraordinary. I could feel everything that I was doing to my body over the years. Pain, I had pain in my back, in my neck, in my organs, and I was bleeding from my nose. And I had a, got a severe headache. And I knew that if I did this again, I would probably die. Most likely would. And I was warned right? And thinking about rock bottom, right? I was in rock bottom for a long time. When I was writing Feast and Famine, I thought rock bottom was like a singular event, but you can be in rock bottom for years, right? And, and not be able to get out of it. So yeah, so that's Feast and Famine. And then yes, food disorders. You know, there are 30 million people in the United States that have food disorders. And food addiction, all the different forms, it's tough. Like we have actually permission to eat three times a day plus snacks, right? It's maybe one of the only true addictions where you are actually society condones it, right? By saying, oh, you know, what, what are you doing? Oh yeah, have lunch. You don't feel good? Here, eat something. You're sad? here, eat something, right? And then you're talking to someone who has an addiction to overeating or uh, bulimia, and then there's the built-in excuse to, to purge it so that you don't gain weight. And that's, the, that's another big misunderstanding. Most people who are bulimic are not thin. Why is that? Because your body goes into starvation mode, and it never knows where its next food is coming. So anytime you're eating anything, it will hold on to the calories. It won't burn them because it doesn't trust you. And so it took me two years in recovery in order to be able to lose weight. And then this year I've dropped 25 pounds, truly eating healthy, counting calories, exercising, drinking water, sleeping, taking my supplements, like everything that they say you need to do, no shortcuts. But now I'm returning back to my normal, what my body thinks is my normal weight. And so it's been a good year with that. And my husband has been very helpful doing it with me and I, he lost 50 pounds. <laughs> so we did it together. Anyway, so that's that's what I want to share so far. Um, did you have any questions for me on this? I don't know that I've ever struggled with that same kind of thing, but I know when I first quit using drugs, food was one of the big things that I replaced that with. It was like, all right, well, I'm not going to smoke meth anymore, but I'll eat a whole large pizza by myself in one sitting and I'll justify it because this is healthier than what I was doing. So I can, I, I can definitely relate on some levels to what you've shared. And, and from what I've learned just from all the different conversations that I've had with different people that struggle with different types of addictions and, and, and those kind of things is it, it basically it all is the same, just like you were talking about the core of the, of that addiction, you know, it, everyone's trying to do that same thing of, of, of looking for, for pleasure and to like numb the pain of existence or whatever 
it is that we don't want to feel anymore. So I can, I can relate on that kind of level of, of how the addictions are all kind of one and the same. We just use different things. We substitute different things in that, in that role. Yeah. Most of the time when we heal from addiction, we're healing the symptoms, right? We are not healing the problem. So it's very easy to move from one symptom to another, right? You went from from meth to food, right? Because you hadn't worked on your underlying source of trauma that was creating the suffering to begin with. So thank you for bringing up that example, because that is true. We're typically substituting something. And for me, you know, I had stopped the bulimia, but I, but my guidance had shared with me that I'm, I'm not complete yet. And so I do work with a therapist a lot. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I call it living an examined life and I'm constantly looking at my trauma and bringing it up. But one of the things I did this year or last year, excuse me, we're in a new year is I was guided to become a recovery coach. And in taking that, I wasn't really sure why I was guided to take that. I just knew that I would learn something significant for my life. And one of the things that I learned in there is that I was still obsessively eating. Because I had a double addiction, (laughs) I for sure took care of the most, um, what's the word, the most pressing one, the most uh, one that could create death in me. <laughs> I took care of that one, but I didn't care take care of the other one. I was still obsessively eating chocolate, which is probably I would say my biggest biggest one. I could if you if you never gave me another chip again, Brett, I'd be fine or a piece of bread, but chocolate that was tough. And then what happened was my body became allergic to the chocolate because I I was eating so much of it. And it was staying in my system because I wasn't purging it that I developed an allergy to it. And so now I can't even have the chocolate, which on some level is really good. I think (laughs) I'm afraid to even eat a piece of chocolate. I was making my son chocolate chip pancakes and there was like a chocolate chip there. And I'm like, I could just have this little chocolate chip. And I'm like, no, I can't. I am not eating chocolate anymore. And so, and it's funny, I came home, my husband saw the bags. He's like, is everything okay? There's a bag of chocolate chips here. And I said, that's for Garrett. I am not eating them. But I was appreciative of him checking on me to make sure that I wasn't bringing in what would trigger my addiction. Just like someone shouldn't bring home wine or beer if they're not able to, you know, not drink it if their family is drinking it. That's a great story. And it's, it's great to hear that your husband is supporting you in your journey and that he's on your side. Cause I think that's another key that can be really important is to have people that are in your corner, to have people to have that community of people to help you along your journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So thank you. That reminds me of something too. One of the things that I learned as a spiritual teacher and it, it, it's really an important teaching is that on the, on the soul level, before we come into our physical body, we actually choose the other souls who will be here on this planet to interact with us. And so that boils down to that we choose our parents prior to arriving. And a lot of times we choose parents that are going to give us quite a ride. <laughs> you know, and trigger us. And maybe they're not as healthy as they could be, right? So at some point, what's really important that I learned um, when I studied at the Oneness University in India is that we have to heal our relationship with our parents because it affects all the other relationships in our lives. The most important one being the relationship with ourself. Right. And so as we can heal our relationship with our parents, we can come back, begin to come back in into self-love. 
Because a lot of times in addiction, I think we're blaming our parents for our place in life or what did they do to me. So even in my case, my mom, I always say she had a Tony award-winning performance in the play of my life. She actually started me dieting when I was seven years old. And that started a sense of, I was so humiliated. I was at summer camp and I would run out of some, the dining room at, at lunchtime, so humiliated. And it started this trauma pattern of humiliation in me. And then I, I realized in going over these trauma patterns that I had been humiliated so many times in my life, just in public by people, friends, the public, anybody. And I realized that that was my trauma pattern was that I had all of this forms of humiliation. So two things happened for me. One is that I realized that the bulimia was a way of self-persecuting myself to not allow others to humiliate me because I did it to myself first. Because every time I would throw up, I'd look in the mirror and I'd like roll my eyes at myself and put myself down. So I had realized that that was part of my trauma response was the bulimia. And then I also realized this is so important for everyone to know this. No one can humiliate you unless you give them the title of judge. If you don't give them that title, they're just giving you their opinion. If you give them the title of judge, then they're humiliating you or persecuting you, or you're taking it personally. When I realized that, it was probably one of the most, the biggest aha moments of my life is that I don't have to take everything personally. And you can say anything you want to me, Brett, but the way that I respond is up to me. And I can say, well, thank you for your opinion. Or I can say, F you, Brett, right? Like I, I can say whatever I want. But what I don't want to do is take it personally. I don't want to give you that power in my life to make me come out of grounded balance because it's in that grounded balanceness that I can stay in recovery, right? And I'm not looking for my, my vice, which is chocolate, to make me feel better. So I, I thought up a question while you were sharing, and you kind of touched on it a little bit earlier in the conversation. But as far as with the, with the eating disorder, what is considered like sober per se, because we still have to eat to survive. So how do you, how do you define, uh, it seems kind of tricky to me. And I think it's kind of similar in like the sex addiction thing or where it's like, there's like this balance where you, like you still have, you still have sex, but not, I don't, I don't know exactly where, what that looks like. So what's, what's your experience or what's your understanding of, of that? Yeah. So for me personally, even though some people may be listening to this saying, oh my God, that's so annoying. Mm -hmm. I have to track my food. Like I use a, an app called my fitness pal and it allows me to see what I'm eating every day and how much I'm eating. And also I use it to lose weight. So it, I track the combination of carbs, fats, and proteins that I'm eating to, to what I know allows me to lose weight. But tracking my food allows me to eat basically what I want, but not overeat. So if I wanted to have a sandwich for lunch, I just have to know that that's, that's going to add up. And that then I have to think about what am I having for dinner and maybe just have a protein with two vegetables for dinner since I had two pieces of bread at, at lunch. You know, I'm a woman too, so we don't get to eat as much as you guys, <laughs> as you do. But that to me, tracking my food when I'm not tracking my food, I notice that I go for 
extra servings of snacks. It's almost like it becomes like, oh, I have a piece of a, I don't know, a kind bar, you know, or a kind bar. Oh, well, now I'm going to have some pretzels and, you know, maybe I'm going to run and have something else, you know, but when I'm tracking my calories with my fitness pal, it's, it's, it's a sense of accomplishment at the end of the day that I stayed within the number of calories that I was looking to do. And I feel satisfied with it because I had that bread for lunch or I had ice cream after dinner, but I only had a half a cup, right? Cause that's all the calories I had left. So I like it because it doesn't, it doesn't feel deprived. Uh, like a form of deprivation to me, but it, it, it's like, it's what it's helping me to watch what I'm doing. And so that's the best answer I can give you is what I personally know for sure. So I am, I'm not sure about the other one, the, the sex addiction. I'm not sure how that works, but this is what I know I need to do with food. So if we're going to have pizza for, for dinner, I need to really plan for that. It's very similar to what Weight Watchers has always said, right? You know, the system of Weight Watchers, which is probably the most successful system in the world. And it's about, it's not about food deprivation. It's about managing how much you're eating and when you're eating, like eating after dinner. One of the great things my mom did when we were growing up, because I think she didn't want us to mess up the kitchen at night after dinner the dinner dishes were done. So she would tell us that the kitchen is closed and she would turn the lights off and nobody could go down and get anything to eat until the morning. And that still sticks in my head after seven o'clock, the kitchen is closed. Because when you don't, when you eat after seven o'clock, not only is it hard to burn calories, but it really disrupts your sleep your sleep patterns and sleep is very important for a healthy, healthy experience. Yeah. Sorry if I threw you off with the question and and threw in the the sex addiction. That was just an example I was thinking of, because that's kind of one of those that's hard to define, like what is sober in that, Mm -hmm. in that kind of realm, you know, because it's easy, it's easy with like drugs or alcohol to say, you know, what it is, because it's like, I'm either doing it or I'm not doing it. Whereas with something like food or sex, it's something that is part of your life that you're still going to do. So that's kind of where the question was, is like, how do you, how do you define that? And I like, I like the answer you gave of, of that you don't um, deprive yourself, but you still have like this window of, I'm only going to eat this much so you can still hold yourself accountable, but at the same time, still eat some of the things that you enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. I never feel bad at the end of the day. Like, oh, I didn't get to have um, something. I just still miss, I miss the chocolate, but I know what it does to me. What I did is I developed this chronic cough and I tried all kinds of medicines and different things to stop coughing. And the only thing that worked was to stop eating chocolate. And then the cough went away. And so I I found that very interesting that my body was participating in my recovery, right? By giving me some little thing to say, pay attention to this. The cough was like, um, hey, did you notice that you only cough after you have chocolate? Of course, it took me, you know, 40 years to figure that out. 42, actually. (laughs) But I did. And now I'm not coughing. So of course I'm going to cough now that I said that, but um, you know, it's, but you're, you're, the last thing that you said, Brett, really reminded me of a conversation I had with my oldest brother. We were driving into New York from New Jersey and he had a drug problem at the time and he knew about my food problem. I had, I had confided in him and I said to him on the way into New York, I think my addiction is worse than yours. And he's like, that's ridiculous. I'm like, no, because, you know, he had what would typically be called a drug addiction, right? And I said, I think it's, I think it's harder because I can get my drug of choice on every corner in America, 
Like there's a 7-Eleven, there's a supermarket, there's a drugstore, there's my own cabinets. I said, you have to actually go out and find someone to buy drugs from. Like, and he's like, I just think you cannot compare food to drugs. And I, what we, we agreed to disagree, but later on, what I came to understand from writing this book is that we were both suffering and then actually really our addictions were the same because we were both addicted to suffering. So there couldn't be a comparison. We just chose a different substance to perpetuate the wallowing in our pain. And so that was one, another thing that I learned in writing the book is that that conversation that was so profound for both of us, you know, and arguing in the car was, we were really arguing about the same thing, which was the addiction to suffering. Well, we're getting towards the end of the episode and I usually like to just open the floor up for the guests to share whatever's on their heart whether it be on the subject or off the subject. So whatever's on your heart. I'd love to read, read something to you from the book. And this is a message from Sophia, the, um, the being of light that I, I wrote this book with. And so I asked her a question. I said, Sophia, can you give me an example of what the four parts of Sophia's divine path to healing can look like in someone's life. So the divine path to healing is the spiritual realm's recommendation for how to heal from suffering. And so here's her response. She replied, imagine sitting on the floor of a dark room alone and in pain. This scene portrays what suffering feels like. The moment you find the courage to get up and look for the light switch, you are in surrender. When you turn on the light, you are filled with the light of grace. From here, you will find the door that leads you out of the dark room and back into self-love and ultimately into your divinely inspired life. And so those are, that's, this is the main teaching in the book, knowing that pain is inevitable, suffering is an option, surrender is required, and grace must be allowed. And I'm just so proud of this book. And yeah, it's, it's just, um, I know that it's helping out there. If anybody that's listening is interested, where can they find your books at? Mm -hmm. So they can find them, you know, at all major retailers like Amazon and Barnes and Noble online. I don't think I've made it to any brick or mortar stores, but if they write to me or connect with me on my website, I'd be happy to have them purchase a book from me and then I'll, I'll sign it for them and put a note of encouragement in the book. But thinking about my website, I also want to add that I have a 30 minute free consultation. And so if folks come to my website at clarity.com, C-L-A-R-E dash I-T-Y.com, they can uh, sign up for a free 30 minute consultation. And we can talk about recovery. We can talk about whatever, (laughs) whatever, wherever the conversation takes us. And as I had shared earlier, My majority of my work is helping people to use writing as a form of recovery. And I always say when people write their story, they're writing it to heal themselves. When they share their story, they're writing to heal others. And so you can just write to heal yourself. And if you have a desire to publish it, you know, I can help you get it ready to be published. But the key is to get all of that trauma out of you. And hopefully that would help by writing it. Awesome. Well, Robin, I really appreciate you coming on the show today and telling us about your latest book and and your journey. I, I really do appreciate it. Yes, Brett. Thank you so much. Robin, thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing your journey as well as the writing experience with us. 
If you'd like more information about Robin or her books, be sure to check out the links in the show notes. You've been listening to Recovery Survey. If you got anything out of today's episode, I'd ask you to please leave us a five-star review and share this episode with a friend. If you'd like to get in contact with us, you can find us at recoverysurvey.com. You can listen to all of our episodes on the website as well as connect with us on social media where you can get previews for upcoming episodes.